into a mission Sunday. And so we're going to add this, the missions offering envelope for your convenience uh, so that whatever you'd like to give to missions, you can place into this envelope if you had that separate. And then you can put this envelope along with your regular tithes and offerings all together. And that'll help us to uh, make sure that everything that you intend to go to missions goes to the missionaries that we have on the walls there on either side. I heard a story once that said that a famine was caused because one grain of rice was missing. You think, how could the lack of one grain of rice cause a famine? And the story goes that because that one grain of rice was missing, that one grain would have grown and made a hundred grains of rice. And then those hundred grains of rice would have grown and made thousands of grains of rice. And those thousands of grains of rice would have grown and made just truckloads of rice. And so because that one grain of rice was missing, that effect over time was missing and it caused a famine you know and I say that just as an encouragement you may come and you may say well pastor you know all I've got on me is an extra dollar or two dollars how, how, how can that make a difference to missions it makes a difference because it creates a prolonged harvest in the kingdom of God and so that's why we're providing those envelopes for you also in your bulletins today trunk or treat event uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. here at the church. Uh, we're combining with Beacon of Hope Church to offer this outreach ministry. Families are welcome. Uh, there will be games, giveaways, a gospel message, and candy to take home. And uh, please, if you're an adult, make sure that you leave as much candy as possible for the kids. Uh, if you're like me, you like the candy too. Uh, you are welcome to wear a family-friendly costume, which means, you know, if your kids wanted to dress up or something, please, you know, nothing inappropriate, uh, nothing suggestive, uh, nothing, you know, demonic or, you, you know, Count Dracula with blood dripping off of them or anything like that, okay? All right? We just want to have a good time in a Christ-centered, God-edifying ministry here today at the church. It will be inside. We were going to do it outside in the parking lot and have a campfire, uh, but they're predicting the high winds, and uh, so we're afraid that the weather might be a little too unstable for that. Okay? Uh, candy donations are needed and appreciated through the 30th for the upcoming Light the Night event on October 31st. Uh, please leave your donation in the basket in the foyer, and thank you very much to all of you who have donated candy to that event. Operation Christmas Child, uh, please take one or more boxes. We have a table in the foyer. Uh, you can take those boxes. We do have instruction sheets as to how you would like to uh, uh, fill those boxes, and we can get those back. November 19th is when we need those boxes back so that we can get them to the collection point so that the Samaritan's Purse Ministry can get them overseas to children in need. Uh, please see Miles Goodwin after service if you're interested in participating in the orientation session for volunteering at the Houses of Grace, which is the island's winter shelter program. Uh, it will take place at St. Augustine's Church on November 28th, uh, which is today, right? No. No. I don't even know what month it is anymore. <laughs> And you're, think, and, you're, and you're thinking, this is the guy who God put as our pastor? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Liz and I did a lot of driving yesterday. We were coming back from an, an alumni uh, gathering at the college that I graduated from. So I'm probably still a little punchy from all of the driving. Uh, Tuesday, October 31st will be the Light, tonight, light the Night event from 6 to 8.30 p.m. here at the church hosted by the Safe to Shore Teen Ministry, and children ages six and up are invited. And again, we do have translation services available for anyone who would like that. So with that, let's all stand together and let's take our Bibles in our hands.
And we're going to read from the Word of God this morning as we begin our service today. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Romans? The New Testament book of Romans. To Romans chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading at verse 1, where we left off last week. Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God. And God counted it him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Praise the Lord. What joy for those whose record God has wiped clean of sin. I heard someone say once that God removes our sins out of time and out of eternity. And he takes them out completely. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful gift we've been given through what Jesus did for us on the cross and what he did in rising from the dead. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, church. Hallelujah. Lord God, we look to you today, Heavenly Father. Your word says that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, you have our entire lives mapped out in your plans. But Lord, so often you are waiting for us to trust you, to believe you, to take that step of faith, to leap out into that place of risk, trusting you and looking to you to reveal to us step by step your plans. Yes. We know, Lord, that you are always faithful to us. You never fail us, so oh God, even though we all fail you. Yes. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Yes. Today, Lord, as a church, we celebrate yes. your faithfulness. Yes. We celebrate yes. your love for us. Yes. We celebrate your presence with us, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are not a God who is just off in another universe somewhere. But, Lord, you are Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we give you praise and glory. We know that you're here today in this very room with us, oh God. And, Father, we know that your spirit is here to touch and anoint the worship, to do miracles in people's lives and hearts in bodies, and Father, to bless and anoint the preaching of your word. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together today, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We came to bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise. We serve an awesome God. You know, we can praise him with our hands. We can praise him with our feet. We can praise him with our mouths. Amen? Amen. With our whole being, we can praise him. And we don't have to hide in basements or in caves to praise him. We are free to praise him. Amen? That's something to shout about. Hallelujah. We serve a great God. Amen.
encourage you, if you're going through anything, of which we all are, we all have tested trials. But the battle is not yours. So I want to encourage you this morning to praise Him. Always, Alex. 
about there's healing in the strong name of Jesus. Now it's time to put our faith into action. We need to pray for Tom Netto. Uh, he was in the hospital with emergency gallbladder surgery uh, just Thursday into Friday. And uh, so I, I haven't had an update yet from uh, Catherine, uh, but we need to lift him up in prayer. Uh, many of you don't uh, know our brother Frank Baird. He's been out for a while, been battling with chemotherapy, and uh, he had had surgery on his brain, I remember, a little over a year ago. Uh, but he recently had to be transported to the hospital in Boston uh, as he had a blood clot. And so we need to lift him up in prayer, too. We need to pray for the healing of the Lord. And as we pray for our two brothers... Believe God for your need as well. If you need healing in your body, healing in your heart and your emotions, healing in your mind, healing in your life and your relationships in any way, Jesus is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Let's pray, church. Father in heaven, we lift up to you our two brothers today, Lord. Father, we pray for Tom Neto. Lord, we pray the ministry of the Holy Spirit would just invade the room where he's at right now. That, Lord God, that he would feel your touch, your healing grace and power moving through his physical body. 
bringing healing and restoration and health, Lord. Father, I pray that you would uplift him and encourage him today. Lord, encourage Catherine during this emergency that she's had, oh God. Strengthen them and bless them today. Father, we pray for our brother Frank Baird. Lord, we pray the same for him. Lord, that your spirit would move through his body, O oh God. Father, we know that many of the medicines that we've invented, they do help, but many of them are actually controlled poisons and toxins. And Father, we pray, God, that your spirit would just move through his body with that wholesomeness, that life, that cleansing that only you can give and bring healing to his body. Lord, I pray that any blood clots in his system, you would instantly dissolve by your word and authority, O oh Lord. God in heaven, we believe you, and we call healing for your brothers, so for our brothers, Lord. Father, minister to them, we pray, and for everyone in this sanctuary, Lord, who needs healing, who needs a touch from you today, who needs to hear your voice speaking to them, into their life, into their situation. I pray, Lord, for a ministry, a power ministry of the Holy Spirit, a love ministry of the Holy Spirit here today. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's rejoice in the Lord together today, church. the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You know, we're not quite done worshiping the Lord yet this morning. <laughs> you know, most of the time we take up our uh, offerings and we do it after the worship service. But today, let's take up our offering as part of the worship service to realize that what we're giving to the Lord uh, whether it be your tithes and offerings in the regular envelope or our missions offering in the new missions envelope we have, whatever you're doing, we do it as unto the Lord. And let's do it rejoicing this morning. Hallelujah. Let's have our ushers come forward. And we're going to, actually, Paris and Allie, if you could stay, we're, we're going to worship and sing while we take up this offering. And uh, ushers, what I'd like you to do is after you've received the offering, come back up here because then we're going to pray over the offering. Okay? We're going to do it all different today. We're going to change it up, break it up, move it up, shake it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you want to stand while you give your offering and, and praise the Lord, that's fine because we're going to sing too together today.
and offerings. Heavenly Father, you see, Lord, in these bags the gift that we've brought back to you. Lord, out of the increase that you've given us through our employment, out of our income, we've brought to you our tithe, our tenth, our first fruits, and we've also given beyond that, Lord, to our missionaries. Because we understand, Lord, that your word needs to go out, both here at home and abroad. Father, we ask that you would receive these tithes and offerings like that grain of rice and cause them to multiply into the work that you want them to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated today. And as you're seated, let's have the children come forward to be dismissed for Children's Church. <laughs> Hi, how are you? How are you? How are you? God bless you, God bless you. Okay, all right. How are you? Doing good? Okay, I've been told that uh, Dominic wants to make an announcement. So I'm going to read a little portion from the Bible. And he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and statue of the fullness of Christ. Now this is not an easy task. And as Pastor admitted earlier, he is human, he even forgot what month it is. <laughs> and that's why we love him, and that's the thing. This is a heavy calling, but it's not because he's a perfect man, none of us are perfect. Believe me, I forget my name half the time. 
That's why they give me a name tag when I drive the bus. But it's his willingness and his family's willingness to be yielded to the Lord's will for their lives, to be pastors here at this church. And he knows the responsibility and he knows he's dependent on God. We as a board and a church want to take this opportunity just to show him just a piece of our appreciation for his desire to follow the Lord's leading and his family's desire to follow the Lord's leading to shepherd us to, so we know the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Shooting the guitars and stuff, and even in service, they're there working on, you know, just to make sure everything is okay. And um, I've been here for a number of years, and I've really never seen Paris and Ali gotten an award. And I've seen my husband just do a little stint in the kitchen, and he gets an award. So I'm thinking that it's about time that for such great a ministry that shepherds us into the throne of grace, um, and they do it consistently every week. I think it's only fitting that while we're, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, so while we're appreciating our pastor, we should just do the same for this loving couple. Thank you so much for all you. Do. so much. That was a complete surprise to us. And, uh, you know, it did. It, it, it brought some tears to my eyes. I got to choke it down. My wife, I saw her eyes got a little teared up too. And uh, we're, we're touched. We're blessed. Because our prayer, you know, we're going on almost one year here with you now. And it's hard to believe. But our prayer, when we were seeking God for where he wanted to place us, after leaving the church we pastored for 15 years in New York, we asked God for a healthy church. And God gave us that answer with you. So thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Paris and Allie. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, guys, are we ready to pray? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all of these incredible, handsome, beautiful children here. And I pray, oh yeah, that's funny, huh? Is that funny that you're beautiful? Or are you handsome? He's laughing at you. Oh, because you were doing that. Oh. Father, I pray for these beautiful children. I pray your blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great class, guys. Have a great time.
Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Last week I preached a message from Exodus chapter 20 about where we hide our idols. We hide them in front of God and we hide them to the side of God. This week, we're still going to be in Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be looking at something else in this chapter, this incredible chapter of the Bible where there is just so much there, and so much happening. So if you would please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 21. Exodus chapter 20, and we're looking at verses 18 through 21. The Bible says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The title of the message today is Will You Meet God in the Dark? Will You Meet God in the Dark? And let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I believe in my spirit that the message last week and the message this week, building together, are pivotal messages for this church body, for all of us, myself included. That, Father, through these messages, you desire to do a deep work in us. Father, I don't want to mar what your spirit is saying to your body through any way of miscommunication. So Lord, I ask for your anointing that you would allow me to communicate what you want to communicate to your people clearly and that, Father in heaven, you would allow your people to hear clearly what it is you want to, them to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you meet God in the dark? In our popular culture and in literature, darkness is always viewed as the domain of evil. In Star Wars, there's a new movie coming out in a couple of months. Liz and I are excited to go see. We're, we're Star Wars fans. But if you watch Star Wars, Darth Vader, he is the dark lord of the Sith, the villain, the evil one. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien, and we've read the books and we have the movies too, Sauron, the enemy, is known as the Dark Lord, and he lives in the land of Mordor, which means the Dark Land, and his fortress is called the Baradur, which means the Dark Tower. Everything about him is dark because he is evil. And on the surface, even the Bible uses this imagery as well. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us, from the dominion of darkness 
and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. But I want to point out to you that there's more happening here than just the vivid comparison of light versus darkness, good versus evil. Thirty years ago this month, on October 14, 1987, some of you may remember this, I remember this, an 18-month-old toddler named Jessica McClure fell 22 feet down an eight-inch wide well, abandoned well in the backyard of her Texas daycare. You will recall that she was stuck in that well pipe, underground, 22 feet down, this toddler. She was rescued 58 hours later on October 16th after rescue workers had dug another shaft down next to that well where she was trapped and then cut sideways through the rock and through the metal well casing to be able to get her out and rescue her. And it was, thank God, a successful rescuer. And today, Jessica McClure is alive and well and the mother of two children, 30 years later. How did that happen? It happened because someone was willing to enter into that toddler's darkness and rescue her out of that darkness. Someone was willing to go down 22 feet into the ground and dig through the rock cut through that metal pipe, reach their arms into the darkness where that toddler had been trapped for 58 hours and get her out and bring her into the light so that she could have safety and medical care and life. Because had they left her there, she would have died probably within the next day or so from dehydration. For he has rescued us. Think about that now, what I just read from Colossians 1.13. For he, for God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And now verse 14. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has stepped into our darkness the darkness of our sins, the darkness of our addictions, the darkness of our idols, the darkness of our pain, the darkness of our disappointments in life. And he has done that in order to rescue us. Now, like the people of Israel, our darkness is not a place that we like to go. But it is the place that Jesus went to rescue us. Jesus has gone into our darkness ahead of us. And now, like Moses, it's up to us to make the decision to walk to Jesus and find him in the middle of the thick darkness. We have to be willing to do that. Are you willing to go meet God in the dark? It says that the people remained at a distance. I want to share with you this thought. Don't let the guilt of the law keep you at a distance from God. Don't let the guilt of the law keep you at a distance from God. The Bible says that the people of Israel, they remained at a distance. As soon as God began to speak, they began to back away. And they even told Moses, don't tell God not to talk to us anymore. You tell us what he's saying, but don't, we don't want to hear God talking anymore because it's going to kill us. There are two reasons why the people of Israel kept their distance from God. The chapter before in Exodus 19, God told Moses to set barriers around the mountain so that the people would know not to cross over and try to climb up the mountain themselves, as God said, so that the people wouldn't break through to see God. 
And you think, why would God say something like that? Well, God was making the point that God is not a carnival sideshow like the bearded lady. God is not something that we are to, or someone that we are to approach for our own entertainment. He is the living, awesome God, creator of all things. So that's the first reason why the people had to keep their distance. But then there's the second reason. Exodus chapter 20 begins with God speaking the Ten Commandments. See, we often, you know, we get this idea from Hollywood and whatnot, and sometimes from Sunday school, that Moses went up on the mountain, God wrote the Ten Commandments on the stones, and then Moses came down with them and gave them to the people. Before God put those Ten Commandments onto those stone tablets, God spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountain to the people. And that's what happens at the beginning of Exodus 20. God speaks the Ten Commandments. The people heard the law. They heard the Ten Commandments and they felt the guilt of the law and the guilt of the law made them feel afraid. They stayed at a distance and they told Moses, don't let God talk to us anymore. You talk to us. Moses, you be the filter. You be the go-between. We can hear the law from you because you're a human being like us. We know you're not perfect either, but don't let the perfect God speak to us anymore. You know, the same thing happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they had sinned against God. It says that God came and walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And he began to call for Adam and Eve. And the Bible says that when Adam and Eve heard God's voice, they went and they hid themselves. And the Bible says later that Adam admitted that we heard your voice and we were ashamed. Because they were feeling the guilt of the law. And this happens to so many Christians, and it's tragic, tragic. It happens sometimes when the truth of the Bible is preached truthfully in love with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Some people will come closer to God, and other people will pull away from God. Some people, when they hear God's word, will run from God because of the guilt of the law. We had... One time when we were pastoring in upstate New York, we had uh, two ladies come as first-time visitors, and they sat over on the right. I began to pray, and as soon as I began to speak the name of Jesus, they got up and they went right out the door of the church. It's sad. It's tragic. They ran from the very person who could set them free and bring healing to their lives in the midst of their darkness. Some Christians stop spending time in the Bible and in prayer. Some stop spending time with other Christians. Some start looking for any reason whatsoever to keep their distance from God. Why? Because the law makes us feel guilty. And that is, by the way, the purpose of the law. That's why the law is given. The law is given to wake us up to our sinfulness and wake us up to our need for Jesus to come and rescue us and save us from our sins because we can't save ourselves. So I want to share this with you as a word of encouragement, not rebuke. Don't let the guilt of the law keep you from drawing closer to God. Don't let the guilt of the law cause you to put distance between yourself and God. God has given us grace because you are not under the law. We are not under the law as Christians. We are under grace as the Apostle Paul declares in the New Testament. You think, Pastor, what is grace? Grace is what I was shown when I was pulled over by a police officer for speeding through a school zone and he decided to not Give me a ticket. That's grace. I was guilty. As the expression is, guilty as sin. 
I was doing 45 through a 20 mile per hour school zone. It wasn't here on the island. But he chose not to give me a ticket. That's grace. Grace is what I was shown when I once put gas into my parents' car as a teenager, walked into the gas station, reached to my back pocket, and went, oh, I didn't have my wallet with me. I had no money to pay for the gas that I just pumped into the car. I went to the gas station manager, and, and I said, look, I forgot my wallet. I said, do you have a phone? This is before cell phones and everything. I said, do you have a phone? I'll call my parents. They'll come down and bring my wallet. The guy reached over, pushed a button on the counter, and says, don't worry about it. That's grace. Grace. Grace is what I was shown when I quit a job at a company and was rehired two months later by the same company for an even better job. That's grace. Grace is what I was shown this past week when I backed into a guy in the vineyard stop and shop parking lot. And he got out and looked at his truck and we looked at my car and thank God there was no damage. And he says, I'm good if you're good, shook my hand and we went our way. That's grace. It is the grace of God that has opened a path for us to walk into the presence of God, into a relationship with God, surrounded by the darkness of our fear, the darkness of our guilt, the darkness of our regret, the darkness of our idols, the darkness of our sins, and be forgiven and set free by Jesus Christ. It's grace that has done that for us. This is why Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what he was talking about. Don't run from me. Don't keep your distance from me, but walk towards me where I am in your thick darkness. You see, Jesus wants to give all of us the ability to have faith without cowardice, Hope without doubt and love without bitterness. Yeah. Say, Pastor, why do Christians have cowardice instead of faith? Because they fear more pain. Why do Christians have doubt instead of hope? Because they fear more disappointment. Why do Christians have bitterness instead of love? Because they believe that God has not and will not act in their best interest. Think about Naomi in the book of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. She had left her home because of a famine. Moved to another country. In the other country her sons get married. Her husband dies. And then her sons die. And in that culture and in that time, if you were a widow and you had no children, male children, to earn a living for you and no males in your family to earn a living for you, you were stuck. You were in crisis. You became an instant pauper at that time and in that culture. And so when she returned home to Bethlehem and people came out and greeted her and said, Naomi, Naomi, welcome back. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara in Hebrew means bitter. She's saying, call me bitter because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She was blaming God for all the problems in her life. But the book of Ruth is beautiful because you see this incredible development of how she begins to see God working again and this miracle happening and her bitterness is healed. Don't let the darkness keep you away from God. Don't let the guilt of the law keep you away from God. And number two, don't let the darkness God calls you into frighten you. 
It says the people remained at a distance while Moses approached into the thick darkness. I remember when I was a little boy, I was afraid of the dark. Probably a lot of us were as little children. Remember when I was real little, to go to sleep at night, my mother would have to leave the light on in my bedroom. We lived in a mobile home, and between the living room and the bedrooms in the back, there was this hallway. And of course, it was a 1970s mobile home, so it had that dark, ugly paneling on the walls. And this hallway had no windows in it, and the hallway had no light on the ceiling. So it was a very dark hallway to get back to the bedroom. And I remember my parents would say, okay, it's bedtime, time to go to bed. You know, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, go to bed. And I would take my younger brother and I would put my hands on his shoulders and I would push him ahead of me going down the hallway because I thought if there was something back there, I could shove him forward and run out and be safe. We fear the darkness as children because of what we think might be in the dark. But we fear the darkness, our darkness as adults, because of what we know is in the dark. We know what's there. We know the ugly things in our hearts, the embarrassing things of our pasts, that we've locked into a basement room of our hearts and lives and we've turned the key and pulled the chains over the doors and we're like, we don't want to go there anymore. But Jesus has gone there ahead of us and he's calling us, come and meet me in the thick darkness. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now remember, those verses were written not to unbelievers, they were written to believers in Jesus. They were written to Christians. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And that's where the darkness lies within us, in the futility of our thinking. In the areas of our lives when we're not, we're, where we are not thinking the way God says to think, but we're thinking the way we are naturally born to think. It says they were darkened in their understanding. That means blinded, confused, deceived in their understanding. I call this clutter and cobwebs. Instead of the truth of God, the truth that sets you free, we often cling to a jumble of superstitions and untrue beliefs and unproductive habits and others hoard old hurts, old sins, and old addictions. And those become areas of our lives where we are darkened in our understanding where we're not seeing the light of God because we've let this area of our lives go untouched and unhealed by God. But God wants to deal with that now today. He wants us all to be free of those things. And so that's why Jesus has gone into our darkness and he's saying, come and meet me there. There's ignorance. Ignorance means not knowing and living the whole truth of God's word. In 2012, CBS News reported the story of British teenager Stacy Irvine, who was hospitalized after collapsing. And when they did the investigation, why did this teenager collapse and have to be hospitalized? They discovered that she had eaten nothing but chicken nuggets, french fries, potato chips, and toast since she was two years old. Doctors named it the beige diet because she was getting enough calories every day, 
but she wasn't getting enough nutrients every day. Her diet was seriously imbalanced. They put her in the hospital and had to give her massive amounts of vitamins. And the doctors told her, if you don't change this diet, it's going to kill you. When we don't live the whole truth of God's word, when we willingly remain ignorant of it, we become unbalanced in our diet. You see, it's easy to come to church and enjoy beautiful worship surrounded by brothers and sisters and just enjoy that and be blessed. And then when it's time for the word to be preached, we close our minds, we shut our ears, we lock our hearts. It's easy for that to happen. Likewise, the opposite can happen. Some people want to hear God's word, but they never want to open themselves up to the spirit of God and expressing it, their faith and worship with their brothers and sisters. When we don't have balance in our diet as Christians, we become unhealthy. And then there's hardening of the hearts. Hardening means resistance to the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Water soaks into soil, but water runs off of stone. The water of the Holy Spirit cannot penetrate the stony areas of our hearts, the areas of our hearts where we've built walls of stone dams of concrete so that we keep the water of the Holy Spirit out of those areas of our lives because we want to protect our idols. We want to protect those areas where God, it, it, it's tender, it hurts. I don't want it to be touched. But yet so often we need the doctor to take and work on that tender area of our bodies so that it can be healed. In the same way Jesus needs to work on the tender areas of our hearts so that we can find healing. Ezekiel 11, verses 18 through 19, God promises this. He says, they will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Isn't that a beautiful promise? God says, I will take out the stony areas. I will remove the dams. I will break down the walls that you've built in your heart so that I can allow my spirit to flow through your entire life and being. We know what it is, what is in our darkness, our confusion and self-deception, our ignorance, the hardness caused by our unconfessed idols and unrepented sins. We know what is there and we're afraid of our darkness as adults. But God is calling all of us to walk boldly into it and confront our buried problems and our hidden idols. And by his grace, through his love, with his guidance, pump clean the septic tank of our lives. That's what God wants to do for us. A beautiful scripture is Micah chapter 7 verses 8 through 9. Micah chapter 7 verses 8 through 9 says, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. What a tremendous scripture. See, the devil wants to keep us in darkness. But that scripture says, basically, you're looking Satan in the eye and you're saying, don't gloat over me, my enemy. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is going to be my light. How? Because Jesus is there. It says the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness 
where God was. I want you to be reminded of this. Number three, don't be deceived. God is the God of the darkness and of the light. He's God in both places, whether it's light or whether it's dark. You see, one of Satan's great lies is that God is only the God of the light. That God has no power or authority within the darkness. That's a lie from Satan. In many scriptures, the Bible does contrast darkness and light to reinforce the idea that Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, is just full of deception and ignorance and lies and rebellion and hardness of heart and unbelief. But Satan has taken that truth and he's twisted it. He's twisted its meaning to the point that we begin to think that God's kingdom of light and Satan's kingdom of darkness are opposites but equal. That is not true. Satan is not, has not, and will never be the equal of God. His darkness will never be the equal of God's light. The Bible does not teach a yin and yang, union of the, you know, the positive and the negative, everything's in balance, you know, the light side of the force, the dark side of the force. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God has all authority. Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The Bible teaches that Jesus went into hell and pillaged it, plundered Satan's kingdom, broke the gates down, he proclaimed what he had done. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said he would dwell in the, a dark cloud. Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 139, verses 11 through 12, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Luke 23, verses 44 through 46, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Where did Jesus choose to die for our sins? To become the sacrifice for us. The substitute for us. He chose to do it surrounded by darkness. He invaded the darkness to set us free into the light. Amen. Moses approached a thick darkness and discovered that that's where God was. So as you sit here today, brothers and sisters, if you're in the darkness of depression, God is there. If you're in the darkness of anxiety, God is there. If you're in the darkness of addiction, God is there. If you're in the darkness of sin, God is there. If you're in the darkness of guilt and shame and regret, God is there. If you're in a dark, difficult place of life, if things are so dark and so difficult in your life that you say, Pastor, you don't understand, I'm in hell right now, then I got to tell you this, David declared in the word of God, though I make my bed in hell, there you are with me. God is in the dark with us, in the worst place with us. 
ready and willing and waiting to set us free. There's this great worship chorus done by Hillsong. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. He is Lord, Lord of all. Don't let the guilt of the law keep you at a distance from God. Don't let the darkness God calls you into frighten you. Don't be deceived. God is as much a God of the dark as he is God in the light. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, I believe right now you want to move in the spirit like an earthquake to shake the darkness loose in people's lives. Father in heaven, I know that you are here in power right now, ready to shine your light into the dark places of our hearts and beings. We're going to sing very soon in worship. But I want you to know that these altars right now are open for you. If you want to come and find a place of prayer and have other brothers and sisters in Christ, the elders of the church, gather around you and lay hands on you and pray with you and for you, that God breaks the darkness free in your life. Whatever darkness you are in, he's already there. But you have to be brave enough and bold enough. You have to believe God enough Hallelujah. to walk into that dark and meet God in the darkness. Because remember, what happened to Moses when he was in the darkness with God on the mountain? Moses asked God a question. He said, let me see your glory. And God let him see some of his glory. Moses was asking God, give me a greater and deeper revelation of you. And God granted that. If God did that for Moses, he'll do that for you too. So while Paris and Ali lead us in worship, these altars are completely open for you to come up pray. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord.
those who are praying at the altar, you feel free to stay as long as you like. I'm going to ask if uh, our brother Junior Martins, if he would come and close the service in a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible said we are the light of this world. You know why? That's like the pastor preached this morning. Wherever where you are, you are the light because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, live inside you. That's impossible. The, the light of God is not with you. Anyway, that's why, Pastor, thank you for this great word. God speak very, very deep with us this morning. That's what, remember this, the light of God inside you because He is living inside you. The light, you are, I am the light of this world. Oh, Senhor, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, por esse culto abençoado. Thank you, Senhor. Obrigado, Jesus, porque o Senhor falou conosco. Senhor, nós falamos línguas diferentes, Senhor, mas temos o mesmo Deus, a mesma fé, vamos para o mesmo céu. E nessa manhã nós queremos te louvar, Senhor, pela tua presença, pela tua voz, Senhor, pelo teu Espírito que fala conosco. Senhor, que a tua luz, que o teu poder, que a tua unção, Senhor, possa estar com a tua igreja, com o teu povo, durante o decorrer de toda esta semana. Nós te louvamos e te agradecemos em nome de Jesus. Que a tua paz, a tua graça, o teu amor, Senhor, a tua autoridade esteja com a tua igreja, em nome de Jesus.